What are some common mistakes you see people making when they start off their LLM learning journey? Um, see, I'm a bit. I, w- I was always a big believer of reverse engineering. Like, think of something that you want to do and go and go backward. There is one thing that I mention over here: is don't do that in LLM. When you're running OpenAI, it's it's capped at a certain limit. So especially when you run retrieval augmentation or Flare models, they have to prompt again and again and again to check the, the, the reasoning model. That really delays the latency in your answer. As opposed to, as, as opposed to you have something like um, a local LLM, which you have trained. The challenge with them is that their context length is very small. So it's basically a, a weird space that we are in right now. There's a latency problem on both sides, but OpenAI has a bigger context length, but it's a rate limit. These guys, on the other hand, the local LMs have a smaller context length, which you can hack your way through. Like, but then it's the convenience also, right? At the end of the day, you're like, oh, OpenAI, drop down, collab notebook, hugging face, deployed, done. Uh, local LLM, A10 machine, a lot of tuning, a lot of engineering, sometimes it doesn't work. But I think the future will be local LLMs, that your prompts will be enhanced automatically based on your personalization. And there will be a lot of voice included now. You can actually talk to the system and say, you know, very long conversations and it will just give you information. So I see the future as Jarvis from Iron Man. I can't emphasize more that you need to know some kind of coding to survive now. You just can't wing it anymore. I mean, I see it more and more. I see it every like everywhere you see AI is coming in. While it's either you're going to use AI or you're going to make AI. And if you use AI, you're going to be a commodity. If you make AI, you're going to be a giant. The future of the world is a tech person and an MBA person put together. Good day, good day. Welcome to the first episode of the AI Portfolio Podcast, a platform for action-inspiring conversations where we get up close and personal with machine learning experts, delve into their knowledge, learn from their career journeys, and connect with companies that are building game-changing AI products. Our guest today is Hamza Farooq. He's currently a senior research science manager at Google, a lecturer at Stanford, and an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota. Hamza has worked at top companies such as Walmart Labs and Gallup and teaches a course on Maven called Building LLM Applications from Scratch into Production. Highly recommend you take it. Um, Hamza is my first guest from Pakistan. He's also my first guest in general on the show. So truly appreciate him coming on and excited for this conversation. Thank you, Mark. This is just incredible to be here. Great. It's LLM summer. Okay, so what are you currently most excited about when it comes to LLMs and where do you see things going? I think the world of LLM is more dramatic and exponentially changing than anything I've ever seen in my life. Uh, We talk about 2022 as, you know, the prehistoric or the dark dark ages of LLMs. Things have changed so quickly and so much for, for, for the better. So my prediction is, and what I'm most excited about is the open source development uh, in this area. Uh, most recently, the model Falcon. I think the LLM, it's just amazing of what it can do. And I really look forward to a time where, you know, what Hugging Face is doing is incredible, but hosting them and making them available for everyone to use. Uh, and what excites me is that in the future, we'll have a bunch of LLMs av- available to you down to be able to download and you can fine tune them uh, for your own use. And I think that will be a true game changer. Yeah, I found that it was very interesting that Falcon came out of a non-US institution and, and that was like, oh, cool. Everyone's like people out there are doing really great stuff. And I think one of the interesting things about Falcon that if, if you can expand on is the that it was trained on multi lingual data, not necessarily only English based data. And one of the other things I learned is that um, that company, I, I believe it's TII, they were able to to come up with a new method for cleaning data from the web. Any any thoughts there? So I've been a data scientist all my life. And there's one thing that I tell people is you, you don't win Kaggle competitions by using the best model because everyone can use that model. It's how you feature your data. It's how you clean your data. And one of the things that 
other companies needs to look into. And I've sort of, you know, in my classes, what I teach my students also is even if you feed in raw text, there's a noise signal attached to it. And, and I'll just go a little deeper. When you look at a cosine similarity measure, it sort of does not work well with noise in it. It only looks at the direction of, of the vector. So when you're actually building text, and if you don't do any kind of augmentation to it, if you do not clean it, if you do not remove the redundancies, it's actually going to create a noise signal within the data and an over prediction on something else. Mm -hmm. So the more time you spend with the data in understanding, of course, large language models require a lot of data. However, if you have a, an approach on talking about how to clean up your data and sort of make sure that it's, it's in the format or it's cleaned up or created a feature from it in terms of some kind of augmentation. I think that is truly going to change the way, like I've seen myself in my own class that if I clean up the data just for retrieval, it becomes much easier and much nicer once you have processed it instead of feeding it raw. Hmm. What, what are the main challenges you see in the art? data labeling part of the pipeline domain knowledge Ooh. so a lot of people see it's never going to be i'm going to take everything i'm going to put it in and it's just going to happen right imagine you have a stove that, that can slice and dice things for you that can cook a few things or basic things but in order to make a winning dish an award winning dish you have to know how each ingredients plays a certain role in how you're putting it together and then you can duplicate it Right. You can tell the machine and you can teach the machine. But the first time when you're building it out, you need to know how every uh, how every ingredient plays a certain role, what heat it needs to be uh, kept at and how eventually adding at what stage X that adds that effect. This is the same thing with data. You have to be understood. You have to be aware of the domain of what you're building the data for. And you can't just go in and say, I'm going to write the best code ever and I'm going to put it on the biggest machine and it's going to have the most parameters in, in the world. Smaller data, cleaner data, you knowing about it will make more difference than building a larger model to it. Great. I think before this whole LLM revolution, there was a gap in smaller languages, meaning smaller, meaning less popular languages, them not having a large amount of text, let's say on the internet to represent that language effectively to do learning. Are you optimistic about being able to do language modeling on uh, nuanced languages or non popular languages? I think that will always be a challenge and there will be an initiative that is needed from that particular knowledge sector to sort of come forward and help with that. Because right now, think about bias. Bias comes from lack of representation. Bias comes from the lack of um, checking or ch check and balance. So when you do the same, when you think about the same thing, uh, when it comes to um, large language models, representation is very important bias needs to be addressed and that will come through active participation from larger groups and diverse groups of people. Makes sense. Makes sense. You mentioned cosine similarity as a distance metric. Um, I'm not sure how familiar, familiar you are with the, the field of differential geometry. Have you maybe spent some time investigating there at all? Um, a very long time ago. <laughs> okay. So in that, <laughs> I'll, I'll pull the cobwebs um, out from from your brain there the reason why i'm asking this question is uh, i feel like a lot of methods map you into a general euclidean space yes. versus yes. to some degree um this is more on the metric learning side developing a specific metric that obeys the manifold yeah. of whatever language data that we're modeling um, do you see that type of research maybe coming forward in the future or is this thing just has so much momentum that um it, it might not catch up I think it needs to be exhaustive, and it, this is the difference between research and applied. Uh, when the, when you do a research, you have a data academic set of data sets, you know, that you work with. Those data sets have been tuned over and over and over again, and you know what kind of similarity metrics work with them, or you know what kind of things work with them. As opposed to when you come to actual applied sciences, when you have a proprietary data, which does not mimic anything that you have ever used in the academic set, set, setting, right? 
That is where research comes in. So I'll give you a different scenario. We all use Langchain and Llama Index, or at least we are very much aware about them, right? They have a chunking process. And like, and imagine why would you do 500 versus 600 versus 700 versus 1000? Why do you need to do an overlap? Why do you need to have recursive versus corrective uh, split or text split? We genuinely have not spent enough time in the applied side of things on that. And this, this is a similar thing with, uh, with similarity search. You know, you start with buy encoders, then you introduce cross encoders, and then you introduce some custom function. And then you realize, oh, BM25 Elasticsearch was so great. Maybe we should switch it back. So let's call it hybrid search. So there is a lot of momentum in the research area right now. I think in the near future, there will be a lot of momentum on the applications, the applied sciences of that. And that's where my experience is basically. I'm less more, less entirety of my life has been applied. Um, somebody will come with a paper and say, oh, this changes everything in time series, right? And then you put it on your data and it's like, it doesn't work. Right, so I really want to emphasize on that, that we spend, we look at the leaderboards and we say, oh, this is amazing. But does it really work for you based on your data? And I think that's where, we have to go beyond just the model, but look into similarity search, chunking, approach, uh, how do, should we do in context learning versus fine tuning? Those are the things I think that we need to go more, a little more deeper now. Talk to us about in context learning versus fine tuning and, and maybe some of the latency um, sort of trade offs that end up happening in those. Yeah. So, the few shot models, zero shot models, and you know, just going into fine tuning. So it's basically what you want want out of your model. Uh, sometimes you start with prompt prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is basically you know uh, you're aware of prompt engineering. Prompt engineering we we started with that, and we said okay, you know what, prompt engineering is a great way to sort of hack your way into the prompting to produce a result. Then we have something in the middle called prompt tuning. Prompt tuning is basically this is English convert this into French, convert it into German. So on and so forth. Then we look into fine tuning, but fine tuning is extremely expensive. You do not have the compute power, right? So then came parameter efficient fine tuning. And that's something also, you know, uh, shamelessly putting in my course. But that is what my, uh, you know, one of the, my, our last classes was about. That how do you use uh, um, Q, Q Laura? I mean, th that's how I pronounce it. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, that how do you use that to actually fine tune with an adapter? on a Falcon model on a collab notebook. And it just works beautifully. Wow. And that's on a so, A100 or what GPU is that running no, on? No, just, just a simple GPU, a T4 GPU, oh, wow. a free collab, collab notebook. It runs and you create a checkpoint at um, on, um, on Hugging Face. Mm -hmm. And that's where your model exists now. Like, it's just there. Um, so the idea is that that version... It really depends on what kind of, how much data do you have? If you have lesser data, right? And one, you also do not know about the nuances of fine tuning. I think you should start with in, in, in context and prompt tuning. Um, as you increase, it's also chicken and an egg problem. So let's say a company decides to go, you know, there's an e-commerce company and they decide to introduce semantic search and they have never had search, like they're a new company a company called Mark, Mark Shoes, right? It comes in and says, hey, we're going to have 200 shoes and we're going to have conversational search and we're going to have the best search ever. The chicken egg problem is you have a cold start problem. You don't know what a query will refer to the best thing. So you do not have any training data. So you have to start with something, right? And then you see what people click, right? You know, the basic forms of learning to rank model. So first you have to start with prompt engineering to make your prompts find something for the user. Then you start building up like what the ground truth is versus what you actually show. Then you start looking into, uh, you know, uh, prompt tuning, and then you start looking into prompt, uh, fine tuning the model. So it's almost like a step-by-step -step process. Most often we do not have the data to even do fine tuning. Do you see, so it's interesting how both of our backgrounds is in switch. Um, so I saw that you, you had worked at Walmart and um, I, I know a couple of folks there. And what's interesting is the, you know, signals are 
such a big advantage when it comes to a person's business. And just for those listening signals, it just means all of the clickstream data that's coming in from whatever interaction. And I, I sort of love Google from the perspective of uh, they've never changed their website in the last 20 something years. And there's only one thing you can do at Google is to give them your data. Uh, so I, I always thought that was quite an interesting um, strategy. What do you see is the benefit of having a larger language model that understands more concepts inherently sort of out of the box in doing that type of query relation uh, with users? I think it's generally good for you. So okay. when, you, when you think about, oh, this, this does 80% of the things I, I need to do. However, when you're a business, you're focused on, like, I'm going to come back to Mark's shoes. Sorry, we can come back to, with, a, with a fancy name, but um, like, just call it M1 shoes. So you need very specific and targeted search. Mm. That's where your smaller and better tuned models comes into play. Because okay. when you talk about a larger model, you need a very intense com- compute capability, right? Um, and you're like, so all of those things come into play and they sort of men- go hand in hand. So um, Chip Hewen recently wrote about uh, 10 years ago, it was latency and cost. Five years ago, it was latency and cost. Two months ago, it was latency and cost. And now it's again, <laughs> latency and cost. <laughs> Oh, she's all right. I, I love her. She's, she's a fun person and she's right? so, always really interesting insights. Yeah. So it just comes down to that. Like you actually have to spend a lot of time on and trying to understand how do I bring down the latency factor? I mean, so you need to think about a smaller model, fine tuned to your own responses and, you know, done in a way that is specific to your job. And it does it so well that you could have two different models running in sync on a some smaller machine, running at a very low latency and providing you with the results you want as opposed to paying thousands of dollars. So it's the same concept of, hey, if you're going to go from Palo Alto to, let's say, San Francisco, um, unless you're one of the, you know, the 0.1% of Silicon Valley, you probably will take an Uber or just drive, right? You're not going to fly. You're not going to... Ch- take a jet, right? Um, I mean, in my head, I will, but <laughs> right. So it's the same thing. Why would you want to throw such a big model to something that doesn't even require it to be? Hmm. In search, I, I had this question a little later on, but now that we're on this topic, search was to some degree a niche field, I think before 2022, and it now seems like every single person in machine learning or at least in NLP is, you know, hardcore in search now. And I think a big part of the development of how people solve this vocabulary mismatch problem between, hey, a user has a vocabulary, your catalog has a different vocabulary, was to do a lot of lexical matching in with yep. Lucene, Solar, Elastic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now that neural search has come out, you folks can go full neural. I, I think there's challenges there. Um, and search has always been this composite of ensemble models just to maintain that tunability, especially in the, in the context of e-commerce. Um, what, what are your thoughts on lexical, hybrid, and full neural? Which, which camp you're in? So one, of them, so one of them can't do the whole thing. It has mm. to be a combination. It has to be hybrid. I'll give you a simple example. Um, you want to mention, let's say you want to go to, um, you want to go to New York, let's say, and you put in a query. I want to stay in New York near Times Square. Uh, with the, with the hotel should be mid range. You don't mention the value, but then you say, I want three bedrooms or you, you actually, never mind. You don't mention the bedroom, but you actually say, I want free internet, but I would really like the, not to pay more than $200 a month a, a day. Right now, there is multiple nuances. There's a sem- semantic search that you're going to do, but there's also a hybrid search which you're going to do on the metadata that is embedded within the hotel about their pricing. So the query intent model needs to be made hybrid. 
It needs to allow what kind of searches to happen. Because for instance, um, I'll, I'll give you um, another example. Let's say you're doing um, a co-founder matching. Uh, you, you have a website and you are doing co-founder matching. And you're going to specify the things you're looking in a co-founder. And let's say um, I have a very verbose profile. I have written everything. And you, while you're better than me in a lot of ways, you have written five things, right? The similarity search will lose out on you because it does not see the meat. And it will say, oh, there are a lot of chances that this person, Hamza, is more related to you in your search. However, if, if you put distributed compute in your space and that person is specifically looking for someone with a distributed compute, the LLM will really struggle to bring you that because it looks at the entire thing. The lexical will bring in that keyword and say, hey, you needed this filter, so we're going to bring this in. Right. And that's what are some of the things that I'm seeing, you know, like when I think about it, because what what I do is uh, in Google, we use the term dog food. Uh, we basically test our own thing. So because um, I've been building a lot of apps that use for my class and for myself also, you know, a hotel search engine. And for us, it's very important to, you know, be able to, so we don't do normal search like Expedia anymore. We, I build my own search engine uh, where I do, I do my searches. And, um, and for that purpose of that search, I need it to be both so that I can put in, I want to live close to this, which is $250 a night. Two things happening at the same time. One is hybrid, one is uh, semantic. And that combines it into a good conversational search. I think a lot of large language models now are very generic. They're answering a wide range of things. Um, and I, I think there'll be more specific large language models for particular domains. What are your thoughts on, I, I'm very interested in, in them from the perspective of their ability to capture human preferences, human verbalized preferences. I want to go to a hotel that's not too expensive, but they have towels, they have soap. Like I can describe a search in that yes. more natural language, you know, my own feel and, and get better results. Do you think that from a theoretical perspective, folks will start actually including personalization modules into let's say the architecture to more formally model things like that yes so mm -hmm. let me give you a different scenario in whatsapp india people send less text and they send more voicemails right um that is something that we you know that you know we have been made aware of or it's it's a behavior because you know uh, even my, my, my parents back home they will send me more voicemails on whatsapp rather than just so imagine you could talk to a machine and talk all your preferences to it because people don't like to write you know like it's just so difficult to write and you almost feel like if i could just copy paste so there will be multiple things that will be happening prompt enhancement right so it will say you will say i want black shoes I would, I want black Jordans, right? Let, let's just say it will say that, but then it will pick up from your personalization. It will, it will enhance the prompt itself. Uh, you know, like if you've seen that, uh, when, um, uh, when there's explosion happened of, uh, with Dali and diffusion models, right? One of the things, earliest things that came out was prompt expansion prompt enhancement that you, instead of just putting in one thing, they will make a prompt into four, four lines. That would basically improve the result that is out there. What it, so I think there will be some kind of initiative in that that your prompts will be enhanced automatically based on your personalized based on your personalization, and there will be a lot of voice included now. Like all these apps will have, um, you know, you can actually talk to the system and say, you know, very long conversations, and it will just give you information so i see the future as jarvis from iron man okay just just you know so like jarvis drop the needle <laughs> hmm. i think that'll be quite exciting especially with wide catalogs where it could be fashion 
I think Amazon's a very interesting example. Like you just get anything on there. And what do you think is the the application of LLMs to leveraging reviews as an expert sort of advisor? So so you touch upon a very interesting part. I actually use the reviews of a hotel to build a search engine. Okay. Okay. So when you when you search through, so let's say I'm on again. I, I give example of Paris because you know I go to Paris a lot, and I'm actually going today itself. Like, oh, <laughs> uh, nice. In a few hours, I'm going to fly to Paris. But so when we put in information about you know Paris, that I want hotel which has good reviews about internet, it has a working space, and the staff is really good. Mm-hmm. You can get that information from the reviews. So we are. Uh, Again, in my class, one of the things I focused on is to get the review synthesis done. How do you use your reviews? And you take out the, you know, the reviews which you feel are fake. You can build an ML model. So if you think think about it, there's a whole story that is being told in the reviews, the titles, and you know, the the, the text of them. You could use so much from that and bring up like what are people saying about internet. So it will bring retrieve where internet is mentioned and with retrieval augmentation, it will say, this is what people are saying about it. Hmm. Why hasn't, why haven't hotels just said, Hey, just call me and tell me that how your visit was. It's always type out, Hey, tell me what your thing is. Just say this thing sucked. It was great. Blah, blah, blah. And just in pure natural language. I don't want to reveal too much about it, but I'm very excited that there's some very interesting startups that are doing Okay. They're working in this space. And I think it's going to be a, in the next six months, people are, who have. So I see in the next six months, we'll get a V1 that will basically, it will op, get obsolete by the time it's there because new things will come in. But that's where people are thinking like, why? Imagine if you go to a hotel web, website, like on, just on Expedia, even if you go to a hotel website and you click on it and it opens up and then you say, would you like me to answer any question about this hotel? And it, you can actually, talk to the spot and ask deeper questions and will give you an answer based on the corpus that's sitting there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the future. I mean, Airbnb should be doing it like Airbnb. Is so, you know, they have one of the best machine learning teams on the, in the world. They have engineers, they have NLP experts, and they've done a beautiful job in setting this, these things up. I think it's just, I think they should just do it now. It's just, it's, it's time. Mm. Cool. Now, there's tons of shit coming out on LLMs. Shit meaning like there's just an enormous amount of information that's coming every single day. How the hell do you keep up with it? Uh, (laughs) um, I actually wrote a paper about it. Uh, I didn't end up publishing because somebody also published it, a similar version. But there's there's a FOMO of LLM for people who know about it and there's... There's bliss and uh, ignorance and bliss for people who don't even know. Like a few months ago, I went to Midwest (laughs) and and I was mentioning chat GPT and they were like, what the hell is chat GPT? And this is like February and March. And I just looked and was like, wait, what? (laughs) So there is bliss in not knowing. And there's a curse, you know, like you almost have a burnout, LLM burnout. I think that's, that's a hashtag. uh, Okay. that we need to come up with i just feel like uh, like i take two weeks off and or i just don't check something for two weeks and two weeks the world has changed you're obsolete and i think in about half a week you're obsolete it it seems now (laughs) and then then the the greatest thing is uh since i teach in uh, universities to uh, my most recent was actually at santa clara university um so i have students messaging me about it all the time and i'm like I don't have time to keep up. Like, you know, so there was RAG, you know, retrieval augmentation. And you're like, wow, this is so good. And then somebody wrote a paper on Flare, forward-looking retrieval augmentation. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And so burnout is true. I think you should spend, you should actually say, I'm going to spend two days out of a week on this. And the rest of the days, I'm not going to look into it. Really? This okay. FOMO is so real. Like this imposter syndrome and FOMO. And then, you know, like everybody's coming up. Like somebody said, imagine 512 content, context length was godly. 768, oh my God. 
GPT 3.5 is 16K right now. There is a Mosaic ML, which is 100K. He's 100, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who does that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe it's Mosaic or, or Anthropic, one of the other. Yeah, maybe, one of maybe, them, yeah. Yeah, Mosaic, I apologize, it's 64 maybe. But Anthropic is, I think, at 100. And you're like, oh my God, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it feels, it's like I got in like this picture behind me, this NFT recap thing. So I started a YouTube channel to cover NFT news when it was all hot. So we all know how yeah. that kind of ended up to some degree. And I think, a lot of people have been mentioning, hey, this is a hype cycle. Um, what's your opinion on that? I'm, I'm not convinced it is to some degree because there seems to be actual real innovation that's coming. Okay, let me ask you a different question. Um, NFT came in. Yes, companies adopted did stuff. Did it dramatically change the did it change Google? No. <laughs> I don't think Google even... They Apparently, might have mentioned something. One of the most visited websites in the world. Overnight. Mm. Not overnight, but you can yeah. imagine. So this is dramatic. Like, And the funny thing is we have been working... I've been working and teaching LLM for three years now. Okay. Right? It's not new. It has existed. But Sam Altman came in and is like... I'm going to make a product that every single person in this world is going to use. Yes. That was the, the genius. RLHF was the genius and the way he created a product, you know, that's just where a consumer mindset comes into play. I'm going to make a product that a consumer will understand without even asking questions. He built that uh, a year ago. You talk to someone about LLM, they're like, I don't know what the hell is LLM. You know, I don't, I don't even know. Right. Um, now, I'll give you an example. On my class in Maven, my first class, uh, you know, I wanted 20. I, I got 22. Uh, right now, I wanted, you know, a similar size for my next cohort. I'm already way ahead of it. And I have people in wait list. Mm. And it, the idea is just it's growing because people actually can use it and feel it and make it a part of their life. I don't think for NFT, there was any product that hit, I don't know, I don't know where chat GPT is in terms of users. Um, Definitely not of the hundred billion by now. Right. I don't think any NFT product would be a part of your life or everyday life. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. A year ago I posted that, Oh, I wrote an article. I wrote my, um, my, my, uh, my lecture today was written by copy.ai. Mm. Right. And that was such a novel thing to say, you know, a year ago, like November. Right. And now I'm, I'm like, Wait, what was life like before chat GPT? It does seem like a blue. It, you, right? we've, we've all, yeah, we've really forgotten how uh, the Stone Age was almost. Right. So this is what the difference is now. It has become a part of your life. So I don't, I think it's fundamentally changing the way search is. And, you know, you said initially that previously there was a few people in search because search was extremely dry and, it just had those elastic search and all those things. And le lexical was very, like it was, you couldn't do much with it, you know, and every time you try to do something an auto regressive model will, will break for you. So with LLM, it is just made so much easier. The self attention model is such a genius and rightfully, you know, the, the every single person who has written that paper is a, has a net worth of hundred million dollars at least. Mm -hmm. It has created the, it has created a new paradigm altogether. And we actually are considering putting it everywhere. So the future of every website, I foresee like almost every website will have some version of conversation search, which is a mix of hybrid and conversation and semantic. That will sort of be the game changer. Like Nike should have it now. Yes. Uh, Banana, uh, Banana, uh, Banana Republic should have it. Gab.com should have that now. Because the customer will ask for it. Yes. There was this, I heard a comment yesterday that generative, not even going beyond text, uh, generative models are driving on, it's a new paradigm of computing versus what was ever seen before. Any, what's your thoughts on that? 
I mean, look at the stock price of N- NVIDIA, right? That's <laughs> that's really should be a testimony of what it is. You rightfully need A100. You rightfully need A10s. You rightfully need all those machines. And NVIDIA is in the right place at the right time because you're starting out with it, right? Google is giving $250,000 in cloud uh, credits to startups. Wow. It's doing really that. Uh, because, I mean, not to every, every single time, sure, but, sure. you know, eventually if you get selected to the program, they do give it. Why? Because every single, like, imagine the number of apps, not which are wrappers of chat GPT, but actual apps which use AI to make your life easier or do, you know, pr- productivity-wise. Every single person is thinking about an app that uses AI and the use cases are going to explode. Hmm. What proportion of those companies do you think are built on OpenAI's APIs versus coming up with it, you know, using open source models that are more or less their own to some degree? So I use both of them and I'll tell you the biggest bottleneck for me in both cases. So API, OpenAI has a rate limit, right? Okay. When you're running OpenAI, it's it's capped at a certain limit. So especially when you run retrieval augmentation or Flare models, they have to prompt again and again and again to check the, the, the reasoning model. That really delays the latency in your answer. As opposed to, as, as opposed to, you have something like um, um, a local LLM, which you have trained. The challenge with them is that their context length is very small. So it's basically a, a weird space that we are in right now. There's a latency problem on both sides, but OpenAI has a bigger context length, but it's a rate limit. These guys, on the other hand, the local LMs have a smaller context length, which you can hack your way through. Like, But then it's the convenience also, right? At the end of the day, you're like, oh, OpenAI, drop down, collab notebook, Hugging face, deployed, done. Mm-hmm. Uh, LLM, A10 machine, a lot of tuning, a lot of engineering. Sometimes it doesn't work. But I think the future will be LLM, uh, like, sorry, local LLMs. Local. I mm-hmm. believe, like, let, let's talk about prehistoric times. Let's talk about 2022. Uh, in 2022, or even now for that matter, if you would need to use a Python package, right? When did you, when was the last time you paid for a Python package? Never, right? Like you don't say, oh, SK Learn, I'm gonna give you a hundred. Or you, I'm gonna give you know, you make an API. I'm gonna you can charge me 0.001 every time I, I I download a linear regression model, right? Yeah, right. I think Hugging Face is the new SK Learn, where they host Ooh. the LLMs of the world, and you just go, you you download them, sentence tra- transformers, you you get them, or that's it. Yeah, it's interesting that you didn't say any more because it is that. <laughs> That's it. Like it's it's done. It's a wrap. You're gonna spend more time in editing them or making them like fine tuning them. I think in one year, um, I think Anthropic will be at let's say two hundred k or five hundred k or, and then there will be a diminishing diminishing return. You're like, I don't mm. need to use this big of a model. Interesting. It's got yeah. I find a race. The race for adoption is quite fierce to some degree. And it gets, I think, even more interesting on the enterprise side. Um, but I'm very, I'm keeping an eye on Hugging Face to see how they monetize all the open source stuff. Because open source is beautiful, but at the same time, like people have to eat. And yeah. I wonder where that, where that line is, you know what I mean? In terms of everything is free and de- you can deploy and then what, you know? It's also, so at least Hugging Face has some sort of revenue generation through, you know, you can pay for A10s and things like that, but gotcha. they also give you community grants, right? Imagine Langchain and Llama Index. They raised eight eight point five, $8.25 million each. Mm-hmm. They have they don't have a revenue stream, so to speak. Yes. I'm, I'm sure they do. They, they might be helping out. and But they have not made it very public. They're not very public about it, right? You think of Langchain and Llama Index, you know, like you use the frameworks to run your system, they're raising so much money because 
and that also interest it's also very interesting and also very confusing like you're open source you're not uh, i mean how is vc making money of you and honestly i have a I, that is my question mm-hmm. that and i'd be i'd love to know more about that like how does that even work i yeah that that is an interesting question i, I have some some silent thoughts on it um, <clears throat> yeah so yeah. I wanted to ask, the, yeah, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Good. No, I was just going to say, um, what are some common mistakes you see people making when they start off their LLM learning journey? Um, see, I'm a big, I, w- I was always a big believer of reverse engineering. Like think of something that you want to do and go and go backward. There is one thing that I mentioned over here is don't do that in LLM actually do the hugging face course uh, to get your feet in the ground of what it's actually doing. This is compl- more complex than we think it is. And we, there are multiple nuances. And in order to get become good at it, you need to have some sort of knowledge. And I think the hugging face course that they have offered online for free, I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's just a good framework to get you started. And then think of a product. A lot of people are like, I want to do this. Can it do this for me? And why does it not do this for me? And you're like, because you don't understand how it works. So y- you see the same things with product managers, right? Uh, a lot of times, some some of the product managers are like, why can't you do this? And you're like, because it's not supposed to do that. Hmm. Right? Uh, that comes down to correlation versus causation factors. You know, a l- a lot of times people come up and say, oh, this model is doing this because of this. And you're like, this is a large language model. You don't know why it's doing that. Hmm. Okay. So from, from that perspective, tell us what large language models are really and what they're not. I think they are a great mimic model. They recall. They look at the probability. Like if you were to teach the basic building blocks of a language model, it's just an autoregressive model which looks at this end sequence of words and could generates the next end sequence of words, right? Um, that's what large language model is. It remembers. It remembers things that were taught to it through the parameters that were in it. It has reasoning to it through prompt engineering. And you could, so there's a human loop, like it's almost like a human loop who's doing the reasoning through prompts to explain you better, to, ex- to make, come up with better answers. But at a very simple level, it, all it does for you is that it creates context from your text and it, you can compare that text to something else. For example, an encoder model, you can compare the text to text and come up with a similarity. Encoder to decoder will compare, will like create embedding and retrieve. Decoder only does only looks at what's there and just returns you something or generates left to right. Right? So the language model is not a compute. It does not compute something for you. So it won't do five plus five. It will recall someone who did five plus five. And that is something um, I recently taught at Google, uh, you know, a boot, uh, LLM bootcamp. And in that bootcamp, I showed different examples. You know, like sometimes when you ask a complex math question, it's going to give you a completely different answer. And the reason it did is that it recalled from somewhere that someone had written that answer. That means that it's just remembering something from what it was fed versus actually running the analysis on it. A lot of LLM innovation at the moment, to some degree, and what I'm seeing has to do with compute optimization. I'm compressing my model, I'm quantizing it, representing it in lower precision arithmetic so I can compute a lot faster, um, reducing sort of the complexities of of the attention model. Are there any more theoretical things that you're seeing coming out that excite you because I'm, I'm kind of quoting a comment that Aiden Gomez, one of the original, he was on, on the original Transformers paper. He's the CEO of Cohere. 
And he was saying he hopes that Transformers are not the only architecture. Like this is not it in, in terms of everything. What's your thoughts there? Uh, I agree 100%. Imagine you've built an entire hype on one architecture. One to rule them all. It's amazing though, but it's one to rule them all. So there is a revisit to RNN models and you know looking at different architectures. And I think there is almost a desire to, to do that. Um, there's a desirability for that because that's how research happens, right? But the problem is, do you want research or do you want a bigger, larger model? And I, it's almost like research is almost, imagine after LLM came out, like from Sam Sam Altman, ChatGPT came out, imagine the number of papers that have come out on LLM since then versus before. So it's just, I think there is a huge hype or, you know, like exponential demand of this factor coming in, right? So I really want to see more research happening in other, like in parallel world where there's an equally good architecture that trumps it all. So with that in mind, folks doing... NLP research, should they phase out what they're doing and start focusing on LLMs? What's your, what's your advice there? See, I think if somebody has a novel idea and they really want to try it out, they should give it their best and sort of get the attention. Like I think Cohere is going to come up with the next version, probably. Uh, Cohere has the smartest people working for them. Uh, I think Jay, uh, I read yeah, this Jay Alama, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's even writing a book now. I mean, finally, <laughs> uh, I learned LLM architecture, like transform architecture from his blog, right? Mm-hmm. Like where he has explained it. And <laughs> I was like, yeah, about time. Right. Um, and then that led me to my idea because I teach about applications of LLM, like building applications. And I was like, wait, I also want to write write a book now, so I'm just, I'm gonna figure try try to figure it out. But I've been wanting to write one for a long time. The challenge with these books, and I'm going a different direction, is is that they get outdated as soon as they come out. Yes. Right. You almost need to have an ebook, like an online live live book running. Mm-hmm. Because the moment I published it, and I would, haven't mentioned Falcon, people were like, "Dude, what are you? Like, you don't even know Falcon." <laughs> <laughs> That, yeah, this is an interesting. It's an interesting point. I'd I'd met um, what's his name, Ian Goodfellow once, and he basically said, "Don't read any books because they're a waste of time. Read papers. That's the best thing." Uh, so, with that mm-hmm. comment, how many papers you read a day? I do two days a week of LLM, and that will include whatever there is. There's a research okay. paper. Basically, I dedicate time just for that. So it could mm-hmm. be research, it could be articles, it could be, you know, tweets. So it's just basically I collate everything at that point in time. And um, I read, I don't have a number that I'm going to read this much, this many research papers. It's just that things I bookmark, I come back to it, I find them interesting. And more often, now I'm spending time in architecture of an LLM stack. Okay. Uh, Yesterday, 16 ounce came up with, you know, their own version of what an LLM stack should look like. Um, it was late la- last evening that they, they, you know, put a LinkedIn post about it. It's interesting. They mentioned a lot of names, but they, they, I didn't see something about local LLMs. Okay. In that, I do see a future where there's lo- local LLMs hosted on Hugging Face again, and we fine tuning them. Let's and talk about... Them- and finish our thought there? Yep. And then just storing them, you know, for our use case. Well, right now we're giving all our models to Hugging Face. Let's say they're the hosts for our models to do in front. Uh, to some degree, let's say I train on my proprietary data. I don't have in front infrastructure. So I put it on some external uh, third party hosting site, basically. Um, do you think there, there'll be services or, or like what services have you seen coming out where they'll give you the hosting infrastructure internally to keep, keep your loop quite tight or protected? 
I think Replicate is doing that, right? Replicate, uh, okay. Replicate.ai is offering that opportunity, right? That where you can host your own model. Uh, I, I think that's to the best of my knowledge. And you can always put your repository in private on Hugging Face also. You don't have to expose it. It can just sit there. Um, and then I think you can provision a machine on Hugging Face also to just run your model, again, in private. But to some degree, that's still on AWS, right? You're still putting your stuff up there yes, or yeah, whatever computer absolutely. they're using. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think at the end of the day, if you really want to, you can just store it again in an S3 bucket. <laughs> Right. The, mm-hmm. the problem is that I think machines needs to fa- like just local machines like your own machine needs to phase out. You just need a terminal that mm-hmm. has a screen and you know all the fancy stuff and the OS running on it. But because like I'll give you an example in Google, we actually don't use our machine other than for Chrome. Wow. Right. Every everything is is in the cloud. Like I'm not running compute on my own machine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not running anything, so I have three hundred Chrome pages open all the time because one something is doing something. So that's pretty much the job of an OS down for you. Run Chrome in the most amazing manner. So it will be some kind of cloud. Maybe there will be a version of cloud where it's just so yours that no one can open it up. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, that would be. That's interesting. To some degree, there's there seems there's a naturally like let's say the there's a wealth gap that exists in the world. Okay, I almost see there's a an exact similarity in the knowledge gap. There are a few thousand people in the world who have the specific knowledge with which to train this type of large intelligence. Um, what's sort of your hope coming in the future to democratizing that type of education? I think this is a conversation that has been happening more and more um, around the circles. Um, there is there is going to be growth when people combine their resources to do something. But I definitely agree to you that this is a, this is a monopoly in holding large language models in terms of training, in terms of even exposing what data they are training it on. A lot of companies are not exposing what they, uh, you know, I think no one, OpenAI does not allow or does not show. Google does not. Anyone, any company for that matter, does not have any information about, like, we don't know. And I think they've kept it that way because it gives them a lot of power and control on, you know, how we build it. But maybe in the future, what I see is that you might not need to build such large language models in the first place. Or they might be one. Sorry, go ahead. They might be one company that open sources everything. Uh, I think Face Meta has been on that journey, open sourcing Llama uh, for everyone to look into, and maybe they'll expose how they did it. And that should be it. Our focus should be how do we fine tune in the future. And I think you probably heard of that famous doc that came out of Google. We have no moat, right? Um, with the open the open source community comes together i think there is a lot that happens and i i can see that happening in, in the future i watched an interview from from jan lacuna and he was saying hey one of the reasons we kind of put this stuff out in the open is because you basically just get the best and brightest people in the world who want to work on it to get to work on it for free and yep. they're building this thing up and there's no way that you can compete internally by paying people to do that level of research at that scale so um, very very interesting strategy i'll give you one more instance on that um his name uh i can't remember his name but the founder of fast api Mm -hmm. ah jeremy jeremy howard right Um, yep so what he what he's doing right now is he actually i think working with sequoia one of them where he's just a res- doing residency with them, where he's building open source stack. And he's not, I think he left his previous job or maybe he's taken a sabbatical, but there are companies that are paying people now to just do open source work and they're paying them enough so that they can continue to do that. Right? So I think there needs, it's, it's almost a need because you can't do it on your own machine now. It's not about what you know. 
So a lot of Kaggle competitions now are run by feature engineering, but also scalable models, which can run at a higher dimension and break your data down into multiple steps and, you know, be able to run. So it's a game of scalability, which needs to come into a way that it's more like democratization of compute that we're going after. Yeah, I think that that's coming uh, at least a lot of the hardware is becoming more powerful at, at sort of the same price, similar power. Yeah. So it, it's an interesting time uh, for sure. Talk to us about machine learning system design. That's a part of your course. I think that's probably one of the most exciting topics that's coming out now. Uh, what's your views on it and what should people be focused on? Uh, can you repeat? Sorry, I, I think oh, I, machine I, I, learning I, system design. Yeah. When it comes to architecting systems for deploying LLMs or deploying any type of generative type models? I, I think the stack will continue to change and will continue to update itself. But I think people need to get into production mode and Hugging Face has made it so much easier for you to, to do that. Uh, we need, uh, you know, just by Gradio, just using Gradio, you can do so much you can use so much customization. Uh, so you can just deploy something. It's an API. You can embed into a, someone's UI and it's up and running. So that's the, uh, that's one thing that we should look into deployment. The other thing is that we need to understand that what is, what does it take to do deployment? For instance, if you have a large scale data, let's say you have a lot of data that you are running embeddings on. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting that you would think, oh, you would process everything and just on the deployment, you just only run the most, you know, every, everything as an embedding and just read the embedding. Sometimes I've seen it in my class and, you know, with other people, they are running embedding also in the inference point in the entire data stack. So there is some knowledge that needs to be expressed on that, uh, basically that, hey, process everything. The same way we do ML models, right? We process everything. We download it as a pickle file, you know, the entire model, and then we only upload the model as a pickle file with the requirements and then bare minimum, bare bones, it runs on a, on a two, two core machine. I think people need to just get that. Like that is the simplest version of it and they need to do more of that. And once they have created that, they actually need to be in a part where they are actually evaluating not through those blue and rogue scores, but actually looking what those results are. Because every YouTube video you'll see, where does the stop says, hey, everything is in production. Here's a result. Uh, I think it looks really good. Your job as an ML engineer starts after that, or you know, as a domain expert starts after that, because you need to have a feedback loop with your customer to understand how the results are. And how can you fine tune the model to create very beautiful results? So start with hugging face. Great. Well, so far the, the conversation has been, I've been learning a lot and you have some, some gears turning in my mind. I wanted to shift into your career. As I look at your LinkedIn, you've, you've gone, not maybe so wide, but you've, you've gone to many different companies. Can you give us a highlight journey of your, uh, from where you came from to where you are now at Google? Yeah, so um, actually it's been a very interesting way because in 2007, when I started working, um, I was still in college and I started working. So I worked for a vendor that actually was a SaaS implementation. Uh, so I was working on regression and decision trees when I didn't even know what, what they were. Um, so. In a way, my journey has been on data science for a very, very, like almost my entire life. And um, I worked in um, that company for a couple of years. Then I did my MBA and I wanted to be a management consultant. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I wanted to work for McKinsey. Uh, I didn't get in, but then I got into a consulting wing of Gallup in the Middle East. I did two years over there and we worked on a lot of language, not language models, but we worked on regression models to understand engagement levels, things that drive engagement. Um, I did two years over there. Then I started my own company, a data science company. Um, it was very interesting. Very, it was a good learning opportunity. We, it wasn't like I went to a VC and asked for money. It was in Pakistan. So it was basically, I found a couple of, you know, customers and I started working. 
and I built a cred scoring model in R. I mean, simple stuff, but um, it did, it did a good job. Um, and then I came to US, did my second master's at MS, um, University of Minnesota, gave me the opportunity. If, if we were the first batch. Um, they still remember us. We still remember them. And this is why I keep going to University of Minnesota. Like every year, almost every year since I've graduated, it's I graduated 2015, it's 2023 now. I've been there almost every year for recruitment, for speaking engagement or something or the other. And, uh, and then uh, interestingly, I solved a Kaggle competition. Turns out that was for Walmart and I landed in the top 10, top 15. So Walmart offered me a job. What? And the interesting part is that at that moment, I had gotten a job in McKinsey. No. And, <laughs> and then Walmart came in and it's like, listen, whatever you're making in New York, will pay you in Arkansas. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So I just decided that was time. And then I was part of the first seven ever data, you know, the data science team that was hired in what well, like the formal data science group that was hired. We would call it the analytic analytics rotation program. Uh, and basically it was like you will work as an as a data scientist in different groups and group in, in, in Walmart. So that was a really good, interesting learning. And Walmart was like, hey, we are merchants. Teach us. And there's this humility in Walmart that, you know, like being the respect for the individual and all the things that they've taught, um, their the way they run the show. I I loved it. Six years I was there. Uh, and then I said I want to fry bigger fish. So Google uh I think Google manifested itself. Um it's very interesting. I made a contribution to some Python package. Uh, and you know, uh, the farm, you know, the founder put that Python package, ma- ma- you know, mentioned me and a Googler caught, caught that, uh, you know, so, and then they were like, Hey, would you like to come work at Google? I was like, um, like, <laughs> 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 so, you know, I worked my ass off. Um, and, uh, I, I landed in Google. Uh, that was, I think the, the greatest day of my life, I think. Um, yes, I got married also. So that is also one of the, uh, you gotta be ones. careful. You gotta be careful. Now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So, um, so I basically, uh, worked on that for a while, um, you know, two years and, um, it's interesting that I'm going to say this, but, uh, the next greatest, the greatest day of your life is when you quit Google. So this, uh, I mean, next early next week is going to be my last week in Google and, it's unbelievable that I would, someone would ever imagine leaving Google. Like you, you don't walk away from Google. Like you have to be, you have to be crazy, <laughs> but it's almost like a graduation. Like you come into Google, you learn, you develop your personal brand, you develop your learning. You, you learn to word a work at the largest scale ever. There are very, very few companies which offer that Google, you know, I'm very lucky to be in one of them. 2.5 daily active users is insane. Right. So I got to work and, and then I felt this calling, you know, that I want to go more into large language model and work closely in a, in a much, much, much deeper way that, that I'm currently doing. And that is one of the reasons that I've decided that, you know, I'm going to continue my journey in a different organization. And I'm just like in disbelief even now, but it, it's like, like every time I tell someone is like, I'm leaving Google, they, they say, oh, they, they say, oh, congratulations. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Why are you congratulating me? <laughs> well, yeah, I've, I've met, like I was sharing with you before, I met a couple of people, um, someone I interviewed as well, who was extremely senior at Google. Uh, she just left to start her own AI startup. And it seems like now is the time. Um, I've, I've even been having thoughts. I was watching some roles on on open AI and he has some interesting product manager positions. And I just, this thought of leaving NVIDIA, especially who, like who NVIDIA is now that it's, it's really in a spot. I think I'm like, Hmm, it does, you know, I, I get to learn a lot here. So the fact that you are making that move, it, it does mean a lot in terms of what your next opportunity is. So that's quite exciting and, and many congrats. Thank you. Yep. With that in mind, What's your career optimization function? So in that short expose of your journey, um, we've seen that you've gotten opportunities by uh, placing yourself in certain places and doing certain things, winning cargo competitions, et cetera, et cetera, contributing to open source projects. It's a very cool 
uh, you're a very beautiful data point from the perspective of like you will contribute something and opportunities will open. Um, what's your career optimization function regarding, you know, is it um, autonomy over time? Is it finance? Is it, you know, what, what is it for you that makes you choose an opportunity? I think I'm the kind of person who starts a lot of projects and finishes only a quarter of them. That's okay. been my, that's been my, you know, Gallup Strengths Finder. I have that dreamer sort of thing in, right in the top. Mm. Um, it, it gets me in a lot more trouble than I can, you know, speak for because, you know, you, I started a lot of projects and I failed a lot more than, you know, I can, you know, I can speak about it. Like LinkedIn does not give you the option to actually talk, talk about all the companies you have failed. So right, right. a small tidbit is, you know, between um, when I was applying to a lot of companies, you know, at a time when I felt like, you know, I wanted to move from Walmart, um, I started applying and I remember that, you know, I, I have a, like a list, a running list of the companies. I interviewed sat for 205 interviews at least. What? 205? Yeah. Wow. And it, I interviewed for like 40 roles. And out of those 40 roles, I think I ended up getting five opportunities, five oh offers. My. So it's the, it's basically, you have to be almost crazy and, and immensely passionate towards something. And then it, things will start manifesting. I mean, um, Maven, I thought about it and I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And then I was like, what's wrong in trying? So, I almost like optimized my burst of energy into saying by the end of this thing, I would have achieved this. And if I'm stuck, I, I have, I'm trying my best to walk away. So I try, I tend to walk away from things after I've tried them for an hour and they don't work. I just walk away for a while and I go eat, eat a pie or whatever. Right. I think this, this thing that, you know, that you're embedded into the coding world and just not getting out until you fix it. I think that's, that's almost a recipe for disaster because your mind needs to process. Okay. Okay. That's, right. So whew, that's heavy, man. 200 and something interviews, yeah. five offers. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm just going to mention this, that this is, it's not, we don't talk about our failures, right? We don't, we don't really mention them. We only, you know, because social media is a delayed gratification. Like, you know, it's a delay, it's a afterthought, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just, you only see what's there, you know? So a lot of people, I think most people I've spoken to have been very successful. They've, they've tried many, 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 many things. Sam Altman is an example, right? Sam Altman tried so many things and he has been doing for many, many years. It's not that he started out today or yesterday and then he's an instant success. Yes. I think you have to learn, um, I mean, Maven, right? Maven itself, Udemy existed. And then Gagan decided that, hey, Maven is going to be something different. It's going to be marketplace. And their strategy is so beautiful. They put the instructor first and their brand second. Hmm. A lot of companies say brand first. Uh, instructor, instructor second. It's almost like a non-existent. They have flipped the, flipped the chart and it, it's working. Hmm. You came as an international student? Yes. Ah, okay. So we're both international students and we've both work at top AI companies. What's your, what advice do you have for international students? I think now it's a, to some degree, extremely difficult time, maybe in some ways with all the layoffs and there's a, lots of people in the market. What advice do you have to, to that population? Um, you know, I can give a lot of advice, okay. but it is not because since I've not been through that exact thing, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can come and say, Oh, stay to st stay true. Stay. The only thing I tell people is be consistent. That's all. Wow. I can't give you, I can't give anyone advice in the current environment. Like I be scared as hell. Okay. If I have a H1B, if I had a H1B and I got laid off, I would be not thinking about anything else, but trying to find a job and this, these layoffs have really affected people's livelihood, their career path. 
I mean, imagine you have 60 days to leave the country. Imagine you have bought a home, you have a car, you have things. How are you going to go navigate through all of that in 60 days and find a job? So it's almost like barbaric. And I mean, I tell people, if you feel like you're, you're getting in that zone, let's connect and let me help you prepare for something or just get you ready for an interview. Mm -hmm. Do not be waiting for it to happen before you interview. Uh, so you're so, advising, aside from being consistent, being ready to interview at any time, essentially. Yeah. Yes, because I'm sorry, but that's the world, right? That, that mm -hmm. we're living in. And I have the luxury to quit. I have a green card and I can walk yes. away from something, you know, as big as Google and be like, oh, I just walked away. But there are people who are stuck in jobs just because of the fact that they're stuck. They're on, you know, forever, forever H1B. And the transfer is just next to impossible sometimes. Mm. Yeah, I wonder, you know, it took me, I was in, in the US from 2006 to 2021. So it took me that long to get my green card. I was in school from 2006 to 2017, all of which I could have cared less about, to be honest. I don't yeah. care about yeah. school. I'm, I'm kind of like you, a, a dreamer. I like to do things and I just learn without constraint. Um, so I, I really feel for folks out there that they're in that tough situation also, as, as Hamza said, if, if you are struggling, definitely reach out and, and, um, we'll try to open doors for you guys. Okay. Talk to me about MBA and PhD. What's your thoughts on those? Um, see, I have an MBA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Think of it in your right hand and left hand. Um, hmm. MBA really teaches you how to talk to people. Okay. But then. So you get a bunch of people in MBA who are, some of them are introverts, but they are like the most amazing people you know, you will know because they have, they have things wrapped around them and they're extremely successful. You know, they're going to be successful and they're not that verbose. And then there are people like me who are extremely verbose. And, you know, I was, I was one of those people who went to MBA just so that, because I was like, I could be cool and I am cool. And I think I'm like that. Um, I was 23. Uh, so <laughs> I just thought that, you know, I can conquer the world, work, work at, um, you know, work at McKinsey and just wear suits all day. That was the optimization for me, right? At that point. And I think MBA should come a few years down your work. Like you should do it five years after you've worked. You should not, I did it within one year. Like I graduated from college and, um, and then one year later I was in the MBA program. I think that was not a good decision for me personally, but it actually did help with my career. And almost immediately I left my country and I got an opportunity to work in large places and different places. So MBA is very good or you should have some form of like a Toastmaster. You need to have that in your life to be able to sell and talk to people, but you should not be over indexed on just doing that because the future of the world is a tech person and an MBA person put together. Ooh, yeah. It's almost like, like I think the CMU MBA school is more, one of the most technical schools right now because they're teaching you Python and R and all of those things because you need to get into it. And I can't emphasize more that you need to know some kind of coding to survive now. You just, you just can't wing it anymore. You just can't wing it. And I mean, I see it more and more. I see it every, like everywhere you see AI is coming in. While it's either you're going to use AI or you're going to make AI. And if you use AI, you're going to be a commodity. If you make AI, you're going to be a giant. Ooh, ooh, that going on the first part of the episode for sure. <laughs> that was right. Okay. Okay. Um, right. PhD, PhD. I want, I want to mention about PhD. Yeah, let's talk about that. I think we need to change the paradigm of how PhD is done. I think these people spent five <laughs> years living in a meager salary to make something happen. And then there goes a me who is MS. He's like, oh, I work at Google. I would do this. I get that. Op I think it. we need to change the structure of things. The, mm -hmm. the old ways of doing things should not exist anymore. Like it needs to be updated the way we are paid. 
I mean, if a grad student, the PhD students make fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a month, it's nothing right now. Yeah. Like Bay Area, you can't even get a room. Like fifteen hundred, you probably have to share your room also. Like people are paying fifteen hundred to live in a room, but you can imagine that if you have a family, right? It's just next to impossible. The living wages and the thing, and it's a different conversation. But PhD is great if we change the way things happen for people. Yeah, I. It's a it's a very weird optimization function now, especially that um, I think publications are dominated by big companies. So I really feel it for people doing their PhDs in this flux period where I'm almost finished, but my shit's not going to get accepted and. I won't graduate. If I don't graduate, I get deported. Like that, that type of pressure. Um, I really wonder if there's going to be like an increase in suicides or something based on some of that. Like I've had friends who've, who've not done very well mentally because of that process. It's, it's quite a grueling process. Yeah, because the imposter syndrome is just through the roof now. Hmm. Right? Imagine I'm waking up in the morning and I'm like, oh my God, this person has done so much and I've not done nothing. And then somebody comes and says, hey, you've done so much. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't think I've done enough because you see this person. So we just living off, like we never reflect. Like if I look back 10 years from ago, like if somebody had told me, you'll be sitting in, in the Bay Area and you will be working for Google and you'll decide to leave Google, that kid version of me will smack the hell out of me this time. <laughs> You're like, you are an absolute idiot. And we don't, we don't look at perspective. We don't look at the relative growths that we have. We don't look, we don't reflect back on, we just want more. Hmm. And that sort of pushes us in the wrong direction. We already have so much. We have already conquered so much. We just don't think about it. I mean, I know I'm going dark here, but. Um, no, this is good. The, there's a point of. There's a point in time that we need to sort of reflect and say, okay, I didn't have five dollars in my to my name at, at that point. I didn't have anything, and I was happier maybe. Hmm. I, I think this this is an important topic. Um, you come from Pakistan. I come from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, smaller regions. Uh, I think maybe when a lot of our colleagues, let's say maybe from India, if things will work out in the US, they, they go back to a billion person market versus where you, when you go back to a, a non-big market, a non-developed, as developed market, the, the strategies are quite different. What, ad, what advice, I know maybe a, that's probably not the right word, um, what perspectives do you have for people in your home country? What can they do from where they are under their constraints to get involved in this era? So, Actually, yesterday I had a conversation with someone who returned to Pakistan, I think after 20 years of living abroad. Um, you know, very smart people, folks. They work with the prime minister at that point. Um, I think we are, our job as sitting here is to, is to find people who have returned and work with them because they are on the ground. They have foot on the ground. They know exactly what's going on and co work with them. And don't say what's in it for me. We need to stop. I think there's an optimization circle uh, thing uh, function in our head. Is like, what is it in it for me? I understand. We need to change that approach. We need to change that understanding. Like we have enough. We've been given, given enough in whatever relative, relative manner. We need to say, hey, how can I be of help? And there are people who have thought about it. And there are people who are doing this. We need to partner up with them. I recently got connected with a couple of them and I'm just blown away with the things they are doing for people in my country, Pakistan. And I think the, the, the expertise that I bring on AI, I'm very much focused on building something or putting like a lot of times what happens is that I start an initiative and it falls apart because I don't have follow up and then I don't have people there and, you know, just fizzles up. As opposed to having people there who are running the show and making sure and having people accountable to, to the accountability factor is there. This changes a lot. And that's we need to do. We will go collectively, not individually. So you like you can put in a LinkedIn post today and say, hey, I will help and mentor 10 students, right? 
you can you can definitely do that or you can find people who are doing mentoring 50 people they have an ecosystem that exists you can be part of that curriculum it might it might not pay you at all in money but it will help you give an impact and help if you change the mind of five people you've changed the mind of effectively a larger number of people because there's a network effect associated with that hmm. that's 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 very powerful uh, and it's good to to hear that there's lots of things happening down on the ground at home and i do feel a lot for the smaller regions because i oftentimes think they i think that that's my silent fear with a lot of the rapid pace of ai advancement is that the the economics in these countries is not set up to gradually phase people out of jobs into new ones it's just okay i can optimize costs drop the head count move on optimize the business and, and i think um, a lot of people suffer sadly through that process so this has been an interesting uh, piece of the conversation uh, what are what are your gifts so your gift is defined as something that you do well comes easy to you but it's difficult to others what is my gift i can sleep all day <laughs> oh, oh interesting okay <laughs> me, me too i used to go to school with a pillow so uh, do you take naps? Are you a big napper? Yes, I am. Like Sweet. an afternoon nap is <sighs> like because I work in I work in portions of energy. Like I need that mm -hmm. burst of energy. So I and actually code really well at night. Ah, okay. Like that midnight hour is just this golden time where everything's shut down and it's void and it's music in my ears and I'm plugged in. So I almost need a nap in the middle of the day so that I can sort of distribute my energy. Yes. Um, I think I'll, I'll just go back to one thing. I'm, I'm learning to be consistent. I'm learning okay. to have a curriculum in my life. Ooh. You need to write stuff. You need to have a journal, not a journal, but you need to do things for yourself. You need to get mental help also. You need to have someone you can talk to. I think a lot of times in our part of the world, mental health is looked upon like frowned upon almost like you know you go to a dentist right you do brush your teeth but you go to a dentist right because the dentist is going to help you do things that you don't do otherwise and you go for other checkups right similarly your mental health needs a checkup so those talking to to you know in mental health capacities and looking at what so one thing that i've learned that what very successful people do is that they compartmentalize and they write stuff down so when you write down, they're reflecting. We don't reflect. Yeah, I hadn't maybe thought about, I've written a lot over the years. So I've kind of like I have a catalog and across different books, but I never necessarily focused on it as a reflection versus more so as a, like I'm dumping, I'm just kind of recording it. So I don't forget versus pure reflection. Is, okay. I think which is fine. I mean, all... So I had a coach, you know, I took a, this course and one of the coaches was like, listen, just write. I was like, what do I write? It's like, just write what you did today. That's all. Hmm. Just start with that. And then that started what I do, what I did, what I need to do, what is my priority and how do I need to go? What are the three things that I need to accomplish this week? And that sort of gives me a focus in life. Yes. Okay. As we, uh, so I want to, I want to respect your time. Um, what are some key skills or slash experiences that you think are important for success in any career aside from being consistent? Cause that, I thought that was a, that was a clean one as well. I think believing in yourself and not beating up, like not penalizing yourself. So, you know, very long time ago, I heard this song called Sunscreen. It is a game changer. Uh, it's basically wear, wear sunscreen. Uh, Baz Luhrmann. Um, and it is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. And that is my, like, just little listen. To that. I just tell people, if you need advice, I think there is one concise set of advice set for you and prepared for you, which will come from that song. Wear, wear sunscreen 
Uh, it's very beautifully done. Um, I actually go back to it every now and then when I'm really low and, you know, you know, it, and basically says, don't berate yourself. Don't, don't, don't be too happy or berate yourself either. Your choices are half chances. And so are everybody else. Ooh, my, you're, you're messing up my head in, in this interview. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I definitely take, take a shot. Like just, just listen to it. Just relax. Take, you know, um, you know, take a chill and you listen to it. And it was, I think came out 20 years ago and it's still so relevant in your life. You're the first it's person it. that I've interviewed like 30 something people now. And you're the first person that has mentioned a song as a piece of advice versus let's say reading a book. This is quite interesting. Yeah. You know, it, it says, do not read beauty magazines. It will only make you look ugly. Mm. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So let's, let's talk about the topic of reading. Are you a big reader? And if so, or if not, like what books you recommend? I think I always have a book around somewhere. Um, I go on, so I used to use, read a lot of fiction and now I've switched to, you know, nonfiction. Um, I, my most recent books that I'm reading are, you know, one by Richard Feynman, um, uh, The Pleasure of Finding Things. That's a beautiful mm-hmm. book. Um, I recommend people to, to, to read that. Um, I think there's this movie that came out, Arrival, um, a few years ago. Um, it's, it's off a book by Ted Chang. I think Ted Chang, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, the story of our lives. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very, very good riveting book. I think you, people should, should read that. And I think if you're feeling up to it, watch Black Mirror. Oh, that sure trips me out. I just watched the episode last night. Yeah. Yeah. It, the, the cliffhanger is just, you know, <laughs> they shut you yeah, down. I, can't, I, can't watch it. I need to, I need, I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's going to be interesting. Cool. All right. So I have technically four questions, but the last three are very quick. Um, so this yep. for the last one is what's one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, a college student and a professional in that order? All three do not have an imposter syndrome. Ooh. All three, every, at every single point. Um, and actually one more thing, half knowledge is worse than no knowledge. I think that's what our country thrives on. Hmm. Okay. Expand on that. Half knowledge. You just know something, you've read something somewhere and you think you know everything about it. Mm. Uh, I think I started with being know it all to, I don't know absolutely anything. I just know five things and I sell those five things. That's all. (laughs) Um, you know, it's, it can't, you can't be the know it all in today's world and just don't, don't try to be in, <laughs> stay away from social media. Like, of course we are all on social media, but, uh, put, uh, there's one thing that my wife made me do is that I put a timer on Instagram, a 15 okay. minute daily time. Mm. Don't, don't go beyond 15 minutes on Instagram or any of that combined. Yes. I've been trying the, um, after 5 PM Instagram. It's very, it's, I've found it very difficult for some reason. So that yeah. goes to show. Where I'm at. Okay, rapid round of three questions. You're stuck on an island with a specialized chef who can only cook two meals. Which two meals would you choose? Mexican food. Mexican food. All <laughs> really? Mexican food. Yep, I'm crazy about it. Like, okay, crazy, okay. Crazy, crazy. All right. Easy. Sweet. Um, what's one thing that brings you joy? Finding problems, uh, like so- solutioning problems in the technical sense, for example, using in the current days large language models but actually creating something and seeing it come to life and seeing the real effects of it. And what do you want people to remember about you? He made one difference in my life. Mm. Mm. If I can impress five people and make a change in their life and I can impress them, you know, help them do something better with their life or, you know, inspire them to do something, just five people I've, you know, I think I've, 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 I've done, done, done my job. Wow. Hamza, I've, you know, for our first episode, I feel, um, okay, I feel grateful because just as you are embarking on your new journey, I've had this idea for a while and, you know, you get scared or you're in corporate. Should you do it? 
And I'm like, you know, yeah. fuck it, I, I have to live because at the end of the day, I'm going to die. So um, this is one of those projects for me. And I, I, I'm truly grateful that uh, you took the chance to do the interview with me. Absolutely. No, I really appreciate it. And, you know, happy to you know, connect, connect again, do this again. But thank you again so much for the opportunity. It's been amazing. Fantastic. All right. Later.